Hello everybody, welcome to Unit 4 Biology Area Study 2. Today we are looking at human changes over time. So we're going to be looking at uh, mammals, primates, hominids and hominins. We'll be looking at hominin evolution. Um, we'll be looking at the human fossil record and we'll be looking at using fossil and DNA evidence to explain migration of human populations. So make a start. Uh, looking at mammals. They have mammary glands and feed their young milk. So these are the overarching. If we're looking at primates, hominids, hominins, all of these come under the big category of mammal. And then all primates are mammals, all hominids are primates, and all hominins are hominids. So we go downwards like this, okay? We can't say all primates are hominins. Okay, so the order is mammal, primate, hominid, hominin. A primate is basically um, an animal that is a tree dweller. They are found in tropical forests and woodland habitats. So things like lemurs, lorises, monkeys, apes, humans, they all fall under the category of a primate. So we say that their features include flexible hands and feet. They have flat nails. They have forward-facing eyes and 3D vision. They have flexible skeletons, so they can rotate their shoulder blades, um, shoulder sockets, sorry. They have a large brain relative to their body size. They are very social beings um, and they have quite a long gestation period, which allows for brain development, brain growth, and they provide parental care over an extended period of time. A hominid is basically all modern and great apes and humans and a number of their extinct ancestors. But the thing about hominids that makes them different from primates is they lack a tail. Okay, so... Humans are considered hominids, um, along with gibbons, chimps, gorillas, and orangutans. However, a monkey would not be considered a hominid because it has a tail. Okay. Um, in terms of features, they're larger and more complex brains. They have broad palates and nasal regions. They have long upper limbs. Um, they have an axial skeleton, which means they have reduced lumbar spine and an expanded sacrum and no tail. And they have shoulder joints, which allows for that rotation. And then hominins, so we're kind of getting narrower again, are basically species regarded as human. Okay, so they can be directly ancestral to humans or very closely related to humans. Um, we are what we call bipedal, which means they walk on two feet. So a modern, modern classification um, of humans is what we call the homini or the hominin. Okay, and they're separated from all other great apes. So they are what we call homo, the genus homo. And we can also talk about homo being related to um, or a descendant of Australopith Australopithecus. Okay, and we'll look at what that is shortly. But basically, we use bipedal um, locomotion. We walk on two feet as opposed to other primates who are quadrupedal. So they walk on four feet. Um, so features for hominins include modified feet, the thigh bone, the pelvis, and the spine, a larger cerebral cortex or so larger forebrain, uh, reduced canines, a very prominent nose and chin, reduced eye ridges, um, body hair is shorter or much more reduced. We have higher sensitive skin and more complex social behavior. Looking at specifically hominin evolution, so looking at the major sort of trends and um, changes that have occurred from the genus of Australopithe Australopithecus to the genus Homo, the big changes that we're going to look at are brain size and limb structure, but there are also quite a few other structural changes that have occurred over time. And these diagrams sort of show A being looking at Australopithecus, C looking at Homo and the changes that have occurred. Um, so looking at brain size, we've got cranial capacity, um, and that increases dramatically throughout successive hominin species. We've got the brow ridge, which over time decreases in size, okay? Um, and this is possibly due to that increased size of the cranium. The face shape becomes more flatter over time, and this is due to the jaw size decreasing um, and becoming less protruding. Um, and this has been linked to the reduction in the teeth size as well, um, probably because of the changes in dietary um, requirements as well. The chin, Homo sapiens are the only hominin species to have evolved a chin as well. Um, teeth has changed, so the change from a, a U shape to a shorter V shape or a parabolic arch. Uh, the foramen magnum, um, where the spinal cord joins in the brain. 
um, in the skull has gradually become more central throughout hominin evolution as a consequence of us becoming um, standing upright as well. So the location of that foramen magnum, as you can see, becomes um, more central. The spine curve changes from that C-shaped spine to an S-shaped spine. The rib cage of hominins changes over time from funnel shape to being more barrel shaped. Um, the arm to leg ratio decreases in hominin species over time as legs become more useful as we walk on two legs instead of four. Um, the pelvis, so as time progresses, the hominin shape um, of the pelvis becomes shorter and more what we call bowl shaped. And that is to do with our walking and standing upright. Um, our big toe to do with our walking becomes more protruded. Uh, the foot arch over time as well increases, making bipedal motion a lot more efficient. And our heel size as well increases throughout time, so making bipedal um, um, locomotion more energy efficient and less impactful on the foot. So that gives you an idea of those changes that have occurred, especially structurally. If we look at the fossil record, the human fossil record is also an example of what we call a classification scheme. And it's open to differing opinions and interpretations um, when it is challenged by new evidence. But we can definitely look at the different evidence that has been found over time. And that is the relationship between what we call the Denisovans and the Neanderthals. So at some point, there's been evidence that's been collected that shows that they once had a common ancestor. There is also evidence that shows that there may have been interbreeding as well occurring. So the human fossil record is like a puzzle. It's slowly being filled. We don't know everything. Um, and there's sort of different interpretations that are being made from the evidence that we do have. But it is substantial enough to be able to make those um those suggestions as well based on that evidence. So there is also evidence to support human and Neanderthal interbreeding as well. Um, and that is because of nuclear DNA studies that have been shown with the human genome to show that it is identical to DNA that's found in Neanderthals. So there were some similarities. So the inference that can be made was that Neanderthals may have interbred with humans um, as they left Africa around 65,000 years ago and then didn't breed with African humans. Um, 100,000 year old DNA from Neanderthal fossils was found in Siberia as well. And so the interpretation made was that a population of those Neanderthals may have interbred with an early form of humans around 100,000 years ago. So this could suggest a second interbreeding event with humans as well. So from the evidence that has been collected, we can make these inferences. In terms of using our fossil record and DNA evidence, we can draw those conclusions. Um, you may be familiar with looking at the evolution of from going Australopithecus to Homo sapien, our modern humans, um, where you may have heard of versions like Homo habilis, Homo erectus as well. Um, so researchers are able to really examine a lot of the fossil evidence and analyze the DNA to help understand some migrant um, migration patterns as well. And so this prevailing understanding is that Homo sapiens evolved in Africa around 200,000 years ago before they migrated to different parts of um, what we call Eurasia where they replaced existing populations of other Homo species. So a model of this geographical spread of Homo sapiens suggests that separate human populations evolved independently from earlier hominins um, that had spread through Eurasia and experienced gene flow. This model is what we call the multi-regional hypothesis. We also have what we call the out of Africa hypothesis, which is um, referred to quite a bit as well. And that's a model where we had a geographical spread of Homo sapiens, and it suggests that the humans first developed and evolved in Africa before migrating outwards and separating colonies, replacing the earlier hominins that had spread prior. Um, and this is something that you may hear of quite frequently. We've got two diagrams here that would summarize um, the sort of spread of humans and how that evolved as well. So you can see the difference between the multi-regional hypothesis where the emigration out of Africa was maybe one to two million years ago. And then in comparison, the out of Africa theory, what is suggested there 
If we were to link it back though to the study design dot point, we need to know including the migration of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander populations, which is a little bit of an addition compared to the previous study design. And so looking at this, we can say that Indigenous populations in Australia are thought to have arrived around 65,000 to 50,000 years ago. Um, and it can be traced back to the first homo species, um, of homo sapiens species population to have left Africa. So this makes Aboriginal Australians one of the longest surviving populations of modern humans to have lived in a given location is one of the reasons why their connection to country and place is so strong and so important and why we, you know, we do acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the land and we give that as well. And so the connection to country refers to the relationship experienced by the Aboriginal language group and community within an area that they have traditionally owned and looked after for generations. And so the term indicates more than simply a geographic area. It's more of a concept that encompasses the spiritual meaning around feelings of deep connection and attachment associated with an area. And so they use kinship names and familial spirits to demonstrate the mutual responsibility and care of the land. There's a little bit more of a link for you. If you do have any questions regarding human changes over time or any of these dot points outlined, there is another video that I posted two years ago um, with the previous study design that goes through a little bit more about human changes over time. So you can definitely have a look at that earlier on in my channel. Um, but if you do have any questions, please leave them in the comments below and I'm happy to help out. Thanks. Bye.